It's good to see you all out here again tonight. It's, it's always a joy to meet with you guys and, and worship our Lord together. If you would, if you have a Bible with you, go ahead and be turning to Psalms chapter 119. Psalms chapter 119. As we get ready for, or some of us get ready for the upcoming school year, uh, there, there are different things that always come about with that. There are different friends, different classes, different ideas that come with school, but kind of one thing remains. In order to succeed in school, you need to study. You need to study your, your classes in order to do well on tests, to do well in, in the class, to prove that you're actually learning something. But then the, the question arises, why, why study? Why study anything? My answer to that is I study so that I can prove. I can improve what, what I already know, what, what, I, what I think I need to learn more about. I study so I can improve myself. And I think that's the main goal of studying for anyone, is so that they can improve themselves in, in different aspects of their lives. There are different forms of studying. I think they can, that studying can be grouped into two different categories. You have rote memorization, where you, you sit there with index cards, memory cards, and you look over and over and you just memorize and, and memorize. I found that, that, that way of studying really helped me out when I was taking anatomy and science classes because there's so many different names, so many different terms that if I sat there, I could look at the book and, and never really understand it all. And so I just figured as long as I memorize what they're called, I'll be good. And then there's the, the other way, is, is constantly looking through your textbook, reading through it, reading through class material over and over and over again, so that that material just constantly sticks inside your brain. It just sticks there, and it never goes away. I used that when I was studying history, because I found that if I tried to just memorize dates and times, yes, I could recite when something happened, who, some, who someone was, but I couldn't tell you why. And part of history is that you have to be able to say, well, these people matter because of this. You have to be able to tell them why something matters. And I found that constantly delving into a subject matter, it helped me to, to re reaffirm what I knew. It made it so the subject never went away from me. Studying is, is different, however, in every person. I know this because my, my friends, I had some who could sit there and and wait to study before the night of the test, and, and then they'd get it all down like that and come away with an A. And I tried it once or twice and realized that wasn't for me because I'd come away with a C and, and realize I didn't know anything. And I realized in, in high school, I was that way. I was able to sit there and say, you know, I, can, I don't have to study exactly. I can, I can just show up and I'll know. And in high school, I was able to, to scrape by, to make it so where I, I felt smart enough, but I wasn't really showing that I learned anything. And as soon as I got to college, College Zach realized, oh, I need to do so much more. If, if I'm going to succeed, if I'm going to grow, I need to do more. And I feel like that's the same thing with the, with the Bible. When you study the Bible, it needs to be more. It needs to be constant. It can't just be, oh, I'm going to study it Sundays and Wednesdays, and then I'll know everything. I'll know everything that's in the Bible. I'll know everything that I need to know. That's not how it works. Tonight, I want to I talk about why studying the Bible needs to be essential. Turn with me, to, or if, you, if you're already there, Psalms 119, and we'll start in nine, verse 97. The first reason why I, want to, why I want to point out that studying the Bible is essential is because the law of the Lord, the Word of God, is perfect in every way. Starting in verse 97, it reads, Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. You, through your commandments, make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients, because I keep your precepts. I have restrained my feet from every evil way, that I may keep your word. I have not departed from your judgments, for you yourself have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through your precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. This passage, oftentimes in, in previous years, I would turn to because of the, the ending verse, that your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And that verse has always kind of stuck with me because it's very visual. It's a very visual pass, passage that tells me, you know, the Bible is there to guide me, it's to light my way. But this passage itself tells us so much more about the law of the Lord. The very first thing it tells us is that the law of the Lord is a meditation. 
Uh, the author of this psalm writes that he meditates on the law every day. He, he delves into it. He studies it. Also, what I kind of take from this is that in meditation, it's kind of calming. It's, it's relaxing. The law of the Lord is, is, is there for us to learn from. It's there for us to, to understand, to look at in every single way and trying to grasp anything that we can about it. Not only that, it, it's there to calm us. It's there to soothe us when we feel stress, when we feel times of pressure. When we feel the pressure from our struggles and temptations that are, are there trying to get at us and pull us down to the world's level. That's when we need to be turning to the, to the Word to, to focus on what God tells us rather than what everyone else is telling us. The law of the Lord is also wise. We see that in verse 98, that the, the commandments make him wiser than all of his enemies. The law of the Lord gives us wisdom and understanding of, of what God wants, of what God wants from us and how to live our lives, rather than how our, our, worldly, our worldly friends want us to live our lives. It gives us the do's and do nots of this world. And that, that in itself makes us wiser than, than those Satan will, will throw at us, when, than anything Satan will throw at us. It'll help us along the way to understand, this is how I should react to this. This is how I should un work around this temptation, this, this struggle. It's, an ha it's a how-to guide on our lives. It's there, it's, it's right in front of us. To, it, it may not be, do this, do this, do this. But as we're studying it, as we look into it, you, sort of, you, you start to pull things out of it. You start to realize that it's saying, this is what you should do. So why not follow it? Why not follow the best how-to guide there is? The law of the Lord restrains our feet from evil. When I think of this, uh, Bailey and I were house-sitting for the walls this past week, and we, we were taking Max on walks and everything like that. And there would always be those times where Max would find something. He would look at something and say, oh, I want that. And he would take off. And we'd have the leash, and we'd have it as, wherever we felt was comfortable distance where we could reel him back in. And he'd run, and all of a sudden he'd get to the end of the leash and just stop. That's, that's what the law of the Lord does for us. It helps us. It restrains us from doing evil as long as we constantly study it. As long as we're inside the Word, inside the text, it pulls us back from the edge. It pulls us back from those temptations that we, that we may not understand, that we may, we may see coming, but we may not truly have prepared ourselves for. However, studying the Bible helps us to prepare for that, helps us to restrain our feet in those times. It keeps us from doing those, those fleshly desires, those lusts of the flesh that we may have, and it keeps us on the path that God wants us on. Also in this passage, one of, one of the other more visual, visual texts is that the law is sweeter than honey. When I think of this, uh, I'll mention Bailey again. Earlier this week, I had her make me cookies because I just really enjoy just sweets and anything like that. And I had this craving for her cookies, and, and she went ahead and made them, and we would polish off a few every night. And they were just, they're sweet. I don't know, I don't know how it gets to be so sweet, so sugary, so good, but it was always something that I was like, yeah, you know, we just finished dinner. Let's go ahead and make some more cookies. And, and I'll polish those off while we're watching something. But that's, that's the way the law needs to be towards us. That's the way the Bible needs to be for us. It needs to be something that we constantly go back to because it's, it's so joyful. It's so un, it makes us so joyful to study it that we can't, we can't help but keep going back to it. We can't help but opening it up and, and reading through it one more time because it's just it's a necessity of our life. The verse that I mentioned at the beginning was, it was verse 105 where it talks about the, Lord, the law of the Lord is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Uh, when, we're, when we're traveling down a path, when we're, when we're driving late at night, and, and if you try driving without your lights on, it, it's, it's bound to have a catastrophe at the end. The lights that we have are, are designed so that we can see, that we can look out and prepare for what's in front of us, for what may be driving our way, may be coming our way. The Bible is meant to be that for us in our daily lives. It's supposed to be that light that shines on what's in front of us. The light that shines on things that, that we may not understand, but at least we can see it from, from a distance and we can prepare ourselves for it. That's the way this, this law of the Lord, the Bible, is perfect for us. It just, it's there to prepare us for anything that comes our way. Not only is it perfect, but it helps us to, it is written so that we can understand it. It's written so that we can understand it all and glorify God with it. Turn with me to Romans chapter 15. 
Romans chapter 15, and we'll be starting in verse 4. Romans 15, verse 4. For whatever things were written, before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another, according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore receive one another, just as Christ also received us, to the glory of God. Now that I say that Jesus Christ has come has become a servant to the circumcision for the truth of God, to confirm the promises made to the fathers, and that the Gentiles might glorify God for His mercy, as it is written. For this reason I will confess to you among the Gentiles and sing your name. The Bible is written so that we can understand it. When I, as I was growing up, I would often, I had, the only Bible I had was a King James Version. It was full of the these and the thou, not, thou shalt not and thou shalt. And as a 11-year-old, 12-year-old, it was kind of hard to, to read through it. I didn't quite grasp all those words. I didn't understand it. But even with that translation, as I got older, I started to really enjoy it because, it, I don't know, there was just something special about it. And I've, I've switched translations a few times. I use the ESV, the New King James, all because each way has, they're all written for the same exact message in mind. Just different translations help you to understand it maybe a little better with with one translation rather than the next. There have been times in, in classes, both school-wise and, and Bible class-wise, that I've, that I've been in class and, and information is thrown at me in every which way, and I don't really understand it. I can't grasp it because it's just throwing, it's being thrown at me. And oftentimes I found the best classes I've ever taken were the ones where the teacher made it so that it wasn't just information coming at me. It was information, yes, but he found a way or she found a way to to really make it matter. And that's what the Bible does. It makes it matter to us. If we're studying through it and we're reading passages and we, we can look at it and say, you know, yes, this may have happened so much so long ago, but it's still applicable today. It's still, it still relates to me. That's the way the Bible is written. It's written so that, that it can relate to us, so that we can understand it and grow from it. From that understanding, from that, that relatableness that it is, it creates unity among our brothers and sisters in Christ. It creates this, this idea that we're all together. We're in this together. We're helping each other out so that we can, we can reach the same end goal. We can be there together in heaven. If we're all following the same how-to guide, the same directions for our life, then it becomes so much easier to sit there and, and say, oh, I can, I can help so-and-so out with that because I'm, I'm going through that too, or, or I'm, I've dealt with that before. I can, I can help them out. It's there to... to allow us to work with each other, to, to build relationships with, with each other so that we can have that, that like-mindedness of Christ, that same mind that Christ had. And it, it, it makes it so it's harder for us to fall to temptation when Satan comes our way. Not only does it make it easier, and e easier for us in our life on this earth, but it also helps us to glorify God together. It helps us to sing praises to His name, to, to worship Him together with that same like mind Instead of having different, different, uh, different ways, we all have one way to glorify God, and that's together. The only way we can do that, though, is if we are all constantly studying the Bible. If we're all delving into His Word constantly together and looking for ways to glorify God through that. Looking for ways to, to worship Him in a way that is, is pleasing to Him. And that's, how, that's what we find in the Bible, is, is how to worship our God. But not only that, it, we also find in the Bible how to defend our faith. And that's the third, third reason why the, studying the Bible is essential, is that the Word helps us to defend the hope within us. It's there to help defend our faith within us. Turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3. This is a very familiar passage, uh, and, and I, I hope that it's familiar to you all, because it's one that I can constantly turn back to and realize it's, it's still applicable to me because it's talking about my faith. It's talking about why I believe what I believe. 2 Timothy chapter 3, and starting in verse 14. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, 
for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. The Bible is there to equip us. Think about going to work or going to school. If you're going to school and you're there with, with just your, yourself, you don't have any pencils or pens or paper or anything, you can sit down in class all you want, but you're, you're not going to have anything to take notes. You're not going to have anything to do what the teacher asks you to do. You're not prepared for your class. The Bible is there to prepare us so we aren't like that in times of trial and, or in times of uh, temptation. It equips us for every good work, making us complete in the sight of God. It makes us so that he looks at us and understands that we're there working for him. We're there shining our light and being that example that he asks us to be. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, and and we'll start in verse 16. This is a passage talking about the armor of God. The armor of God and, and how different pieces equip us for different works and for different ways that will help us in our fight against Satan. Ephesians 6, starting in verse 16. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. When you think of a shield, when I think of a shield, I think back to Roman times. Now, I think I've mentioned this before in sermons, but a Roman shield is supposed to cover from about your calf to your shoulder. It's supposed to cover your, your half of your body or most of your body, and as well as some of the person next to you. It's there to protect you from arrows, from spears, from swords, anything that, that their physical enemy could get to them with. Our shield of faith is there to to protect us from whatever Satan will throw at us. Uh, This passage uses the word fiery darts. Uh, That's that's very visual to myself as as fiery darts. When I look at that, I think, you know, fire arrows, they would use those to to burn ships, to burn buildings. And if you have a shield, it'll take the arrow and, and you won't burn. You won't get hurt. And that's what our faith will do for us. It'll be there to protect us. But not only will, will our faith be there to protect us, but in this passage we also read that the, that the sword of God, which is the word of God, is there to, to help us be that ambassador for the word. To be there to teach others, to, to show others why we believe what we believe. That in itself is, is just as good as a defense as just having that shield of faith. Having that belief. That, that reason why you believe what you believe, why I believe what, you, what I believe is there so I can, I can understand it, that I'm not believing it because my parents believed it. I'm not believing it because my friends told me it. I've found a way to, to make it real to me, to make it so that I understand my own belief. And that's, that's what God asks of us, is to have that reason, have that reason for the hope that's within us. Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3, uh, verse 15. It reads, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you, with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better, if it is the will of God, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Think of, me, think of this with me real quick. When you think of, of sports fans... The most passionate ones are the ones who, who are watching the games every week. They have, they have this defense every single time you come up to them and say, yeah, you know, your team's not really good. They're, they're messing up. They lost last week. They're, they're just not going to do anything good. And they'll, they're very quick to come back at you. Well, yeah, well, my team's better than this and this and this. They have a reason for, for believing in their team. They have a reason for believing that their team will do better. That's how quick we need to be with our faith. We need to have a reason for our faith like that. That whenever someone comes up to us and says, well, why do you believe in God? Why do you believe that you should be living your life like this and not just doing whatever you want? We shouldn't have to who sit there for, for a few minutes and just, just, you know, oh, I've never prepared for this before. I've never thought about that. Why do I believe what I believe? We should be able to sit there and say, well, well this is why I believe. I believe in this because of this. Because it, it, it reflects this. 
we should have that quick defense always ready because we never know when someone's going to come our way and, and, and throw something at us that we may not expect. But in order to have that quick response, we need to be studying the Bible. We need to be diving into it as much as we can, coming back to it as often as possible because it's essential to our lives as Christians. It's essential to our lives and to our faith. To have that, that background in, in the Bible, to have that understanding of what God actually wants from us. Do we do enough to make the Bible, studying the Bible essential? Oftentimes, I've found this in my own life, that, that I'll, I'll set out a plan and, and think, I'm going to study this every night. I, will, I have this own plan to how I'm going to go through the Bible. And then other things will, will creep into that. It'll start, well, I've, I've got to do this. I, I've got to do this. I've, I've got to call someone. I've got to go out and do this for, for the upkeep of where I live. And slowly that reading the Bible, that studying starts to go down. It starts to disappear almost until we get to the end of the day. And I, I sit there. And I'm like, well, I'm too tired now. I'll, I'll do it tomorrow. We didn't make the Bible so essential, the studying the Bible so essential that it's the first thing we do almost. Or, or we wake up and you, you want to start the day off, right? So you, you, you go to your Bible. You go to something that will help calm you and prepare you for the rest of the day. We need to make studying the Bible essential in our lives. We need to make that a priority over some other things. Will you bow with me? Heavenly Father, we come to you now. We thank you so much for this opportunity you have given us tonight to, to worship you and to study in your word and learn more about what you want from us. We pray, Father, that as this school year is about to start, that you will help us to to prioritize correctly, to focus on you first and foremost, and understand that through you everything will, will be taken care of. We pray that we will, we will make it a priority to study your word, to dive into your word, and to understand more so how to be better lights, better examples of you in this world. We pray that we do all this with your, glorif your glorification in mind, Father, that we, that we will glorify you with everything we do. It's in your Son's name we pray. Amen. When you study the Bible, when you, when you read through the Bible, you, you start to realize things in your life. In my life, when I started studying the Bible, I realized that in order to be saved, I needed to be baptized, to repent of my sins. And it's, it's constant throughout the New Testament that that's what needs to be done if, if you are to truly put on Christ and live as he, he wants you to live. And so I ask that if there are any among us tonight who, who have been studying or would like to study, or if you have any reason to come forward at all, won't you come now while we stand and see?